about today. We're going to jump back in to our brand new series called Choose Joy. And I love this series because it's just been personally so edifying for me. It's just been growing me up and helping me to do that, just choose joy. Because I found in my life that often my attitude is, is really built on what's going on around me. And so this has been so helpful for me. And I've heard from so many of you that it's been helpful. And, um, and, and here's kind of the core of the whole series is that joy, no matter what's going on in your life, is a choice. That no matter what you're facing, from the worst things to the best things, joy is a choice in your life. Now, we're walking through the book of Philippians written by the Apostle Paul. And, and the interesting thing about this book, it is the happiest book in all of the Bible. It, it talks about joy and happiness more than any other book in the Bible. But there's also another uniqueness of Paul's writings it is one of the most relational in all of the Bible. Paul, actually what it, you're reading is not a sermon, it's actually a thank you note to the people in Philippi. Paul is writing to the Philippians, he planted the church there almost uh, 11 years earlier, and he is writing from a prison in Rome. And he's writing them a thank you note saying, hey, thanks for all your love and support. This relationship that we share has actually gotten me through some of the toughest times in my life. And when you read that and you kind of realize that, you're like, wow wow, it starts to make more sense and you understand what Paul is really, he's talking about a relationship. But here's the other thing we know about reading uh, the Apostle Paul's writings is that all his relationships were not as good as that. He, he, a lot of his relationships were strained and he struggled with them and he talks a lot about them. For instance, the whole chapter two of this book is about how to work through and have joy in relational challenges. So that's what we're going to spend time on today is, is really looking through that because Paul realized something that we realized that if you have um, unhappy relationships, you're probably experiencing an unhappy life. L look at how Paul put it here in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 2. He says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and in one mind. Now, he's basically praying what every parent's ever prayed. Can you all just get along and make me happy? That's basically what he, he's saying here is, can you guys just get along? It would make me so happy. I'd have have so much joy if you would just learn to get along. And, and that's really true in our lives. If, if you've got unhappy relationships, you, you probably aren't experiencing a lot of happiness. You know, in, in your life, you're struggling. I've met people all over the world who have fame and, and esteem and, and money, but you know what? If they're going through a divorce, no joy. I've met people who, who are just have all that they would ever want and desire, but if their kids are estranged from them, no joy. You cannot have harmony apart from, ha or cannot have happiness apart from harmony. You have to realize that your relationships play a huge role in the amount of joy that you're going to have in your life. And that's why Paul dedicates a whole section of this letter to working out and, and living through these relational challenges. Now, here's the thing that I, I want you to say, understand up front, and I want to say up front, because I think sometimes when we think of joy in relationships, um, we may have a misunderstanding. Joy, choosing joy in relationships is not faking your way through relationships. Choosing joy is not faking your way through relationships. When I was a, a kid, my mom and dad took us to family reunions. Uh, how many of you, you, got to, uh, you went to family reunions? That I, I, I felt like we went to every family reunion possible, like grandmother's family reunion, grandfather's family reunion, like second cousin twice removed's family reunion. There were moments that I felt like we went to family reunions that we weren't even family and we were just going for a free meal. Like I felt like we were constantly eating at these places these family reunions and, and, and I just did not enjoy them. I despise them, honestly. And here's why. I just don't enjoy hanging out with people I don't know and, and I don't enjoy taking pictures with people I've never met. And it always seemed like I got stuck sitting beside the crazy uncle, right? Your family's got one. My family's got plenty. It's the guy who's got an aluminum hat that he wears around and thinks the government's listening to him all the time. You know, I always get stuck beside that guy at family reunions. And so for me, it was just, I, I just remember begging my mom and dad every summer please don't make us go to these family reunions and I remember it was almost always the same we would pull up everybody's getting out of the car and they would look back and say the same thing just grin and bear it just grin and bear it that that, that was kind of their response to me well here, here's the truth I think a lot of us when it comes to joy in our relationships we think that's what joy is just grinning and bearing it for a lot of us, we may have some real marriage issues. And, and, and when we're around friends, we just grin and bear it. 
And, and then for some of us, you know, we have some serious relationships with, with our teenager. And, and right now we're just choosing to grin and bear it because they won't live here much longer. You know, and, and then for, for some of you, you may have a boss who you find yourself during the day thinking of things that you would like to do to him and hurt him. And then when he comes down the hall, you just grin and bear it, right? I mean, we, we kind of start thinking that, that relationships, the only way to have happiness is just to grin and bear it. But um, that's not really what we're going to find in Philippians. Paul says there really is a key to choosing joy, even in the most difficult relationships. But he, i got to let you in on a little secret. Um, this message is going to very thoroughly take you through how you can have joy in relationships. And you're going to love it and hate it. You're going to love this message, and you're going to hate this message. Because you're going to love it because you're going to find out that you can actually break free from the, the fake smile of grinning and bearing it in your relationships. You're going to find that when you apply what Paul lays out in Philippians chapter 2, that actually it is guaranteed to work. That no relationship, no matter how bad, has ever it, it not been repaired by doing the things we're going to talk about. You're going to love this. Where you have conflict now will be replaced with harmony if you apply what we're talking about. So you're going to love it, but you're also going to hate it. And here's why. Everything I'm going to share with you goes against your very nature. Everything I'm going to share with you goes against everything culture has taught you about relationships. Most of the time, almost exclusively, culture teaches us the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches us about relationships. And, and so you, this is going to be tough. As a matter of fact, if you read, the, I've read it multiple times this week, and every time it has challenged me when I've read Philippians chapter 2. If you read it, it may be one of the most challenging passages of Scripture in all the Bible on relationships. But I just believe through the power of the Holy Spirit, you're up for the challenge. And I believe today people are going to leave with a new mindset and be able to see relationships that may have been broken for years repaired and walked out because of the God's word and how it changes our lives. So you up for the challenge? We're going to jump into it. Here it is. In, 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 when we jump into verse number three, right out of the gate, here's what Paul says. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. <laughs> That's pretty tough right out of the gate. Like do nothing. Like, I would be happy if Paul would have just said, like, just try not to do most things out of this. But he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Look what he goes on to say. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Man, that's tough. I mean, right out of the gate, Paul, Paul just, he goes straight to it. He, he doesn't dance around it. He doesn't warm us up. He goes straight into it. And here's what he's unpacking, some central truths about relationships. He, he's unpacking really kind of the big picture issue in every relationship. Now, here's part of our problem is when we have a relationship fail, we tend to get mucked up in the details. We, we tend to kind of feel like that a relationship broke down for a very certain amount of, of detail. Like, I'll give you an example example, we got divorced over communication. That, that's why we got divorced. And, or maybe for you, you'd say, well, I don't work there anymore because they didn't appreciate me. Or, or maybe you're like, I don't like that guy because he took the last Krispy Kreme, and that's why I don't like that guy. You know what I mean? It, it, the, the point is, is that, that we get caught up in the details, and what Paul's doing right out of the gate is he's saying, hey, there's actually the details are not the big problem. Here's the two central issues, and he gives us two rules, and I mean, these will change your life if you get them, two rules that are inescapable in every relationship. Here they are. Number one, pride destroys relationships. Right out of the gate, Paul says, it doesn't matter what the details are, pride destroys relationships. And then he goes on to say next, he says, humility deepens relationships. He says, it doesn't matter what the details are, how it works out, who did what to who, and, and how it all shook, that, that pride destroys them and humility deepens them. And he says, these are kind of the big issues that you really need to work on because when you get lost in the details, you end up kind of absolving yourself of responsibility. You start to say, well, if they would have done that better than I would have, or if it would have went differently, I could have. But what Paul says is ultimately, pride destroys and humility deepens. And, and he says, you've got to understand this because in every relationship, these two things are active, pride and humility. Every relationship. And which one you give more time and attention to determines the quality of the relationship. That when relationships are built on pride, the quality's not real high, but when they're based on humility, the quality goes through the roof. Now here's the tough thing about pride. Nobody thinks they have it. 
That, that, that really is the tough thing about pride is we, we kind of, I mean, we can recognize it in other people. We, 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 we think there's probably an acceptable amount of it that we can have, but here's the real truth. We don't think we have it. None of us would say, you know what, I've got a pride problem. So here's what I need you to do with me today. Let's assume we all are ignorant to our pride. Let's just assume that we believe the lie and that every one of us is the most prideful person that has, we've ever encountered in life. Let's just assume that the most prideful person you've ever met was in the mirror just so we can grab what Paul's talking about here. Now, here's what you have to know initially about pride. It is the, the core. It is the birthplace, the root of every other sin. That pride is the birthplace of every other sin. That every sin that you've ever committed, every conflict you've ever had, has so much pride mixed into it, and that's the reason that it exists. For, for us, we have to realize that, that pride is one of these things that, that it just it seeps through us, it's natural to us, and that it ends up driving more of our, our actions, our words, than you would ever realize. You also need to realize this, pride is your greatest enemy in your life. It's the greatest enemy that you have working in your life. And if pride's our greatest enemy, guess what? Humility is your greatest friend. Every relationship, every relationship that has ever been successful has a foundation of humility. The greatest marriages, the greatest friendships, the greatest relationships are built on a foundation of humility. But here's the problem. Humility may be one of the most misunderstood qualities we need in our lives. I mean, I, I think we have a total messed up view of humility. For a lot of us, we think humility is putting ourselves down, like saying, I'm nothing, and I, I'm no good, and it's, it's like that we're degrade ourselves. That's what it means to be humble. That's not true at all. That's not what humility is. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. Do you hear the difference there? It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It, it, let me put it this way. Humility is not putting myself down. It's building others up. Humility in the difference in pride is there's a major difference, and it's what you're focused on. Let, let me give you this. Um, pride, the, the, the middle, letter, middle letter of the word pride is what? I. The middle letter of the word crime is what? The middle letter of the word sin is what? I. See, pride is I have an I, I, I problem. I, I, it's about me. It's about what I want, when I want it, how I want it. Th that's what he's basically saying. It's selfish ambition and vain conceit. It's about that it all has to be about you. That it has to be about what you want and where you want to be and how you want it and how you want to be esteemed and what you want to be looking at. He said, anytime that you're viewing life through this I, I, I mentality, you're going to end up with a relationship that's destroyed. But he says, if you can, on the other hand, look through the lens of others first, it makes a huge difference. For instance, when I walk into this room, I'm either going to look at this room through pride or humility. If I walk through and I look at it through pride, I'm thinking, what do other people think about me? I wonder if anybody likes this jacket I bought. I wonder if people care about what I'm doing or what I think or what I did this week. Versus when I walk in this room, who can I help? Who can I pray for? Who can I encourage? Who can I bless? Two totally different mindsets. Pr humility doesn't require you to put yourself down. It just requires you to pick others up. That's the whole key, Paul says, is what is the center of all your motives? Is it pride or is it humility? Is it yourself or is it other people? Now, why should you want humility? Why, why is humility such an important part of your life? Why should you want to be humble? You probably don't know this, and, and I want you to grasp this. Um, th th there are more promises in the Bible, from God, about humility than anything other than generosity in the Bible. That's significant. Like if you said that, that a generous person and a humble person have more of God's promises in their life than anybody else, you would be saying that accurately. Because generosity is number one. If you're generous, there are more promises in the Bible for you than any other, any other trait. But second is humility. For humble people, there are an extraordinary amount of promises. I want to give you one of them from James chapter 4. Look at what it says. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Look at this word opposes. Consider just for a second this word. That any time you operate in pride. When you think of yourself, when you're selfish, when you do things in attitude, deed, or word that say me first, you have set yourself up in opposition to God. Now, that's serious. That means that in a relationship, when you try to get your way, when, when you're all about you, when you only care about what you've got going on, you know what that means? You're picking a fight with God. I mean, that, that's significant. Who wants to go around picking a fight with God? Pride does. 
You know, some people think God has no hate. God actually tells us in Scripture some things he hates. You know what's top of the list? Pride. Pride. God hates it. He, he, he doesn't like it. He literally, he's in opposition to it. Meaning that if you and your relationship are saying, well, this is what I deserve, and this is how I should be viewed, and this is what you owe me, God is opposing you in that relationship. Now, on the same side, look, look, look at what he gives. To the humble, what's he give? Grace. You know what grace is? Grace is God-given ability to do what you cannot do for yourself. God, grace is the ability to literally, it's supernatural strength to do what you cannot do for yourself. That's an incredible promise. It means when you don't want to forgive and you can't do it in your own strength, grace gives you strength supernaturally to do it. It means when you can't, can't resolve a conflict and, and you, just, you feel like you're, you're just butting heads constantly, if you'll humble yourself, grace will be poured in and you can actually have the ability supernaturally to, to resolve that conflict. Here's what it really means, and I want you to get this, there is no relationship so damaged that it cannot be healed through humility because no relationship is far from grace. That, that's how powerful this concept is, is that the worst relationships, I'm talking parents haven't talked to kids for years, husband and wife haven't slept in the same bed for months, I'm talking about people who cannot stand their employer, no relationship is so damaged that humility can't hear it, or can't heal it because humility brings grace. It, it, this is the way it puts it is when you're humble all of a sudden what God's been working against he starts to work for now that, that's a powerful principle how important are these two rules to understand in your relationships well I, I don't know that you could be successful in your relationships without these two rules but he, here's why I want you to really understand it, it just to this point about joy without harmony no happiness without harmony there's no happiness <laughs> and harmony is only possible through humility so, so what that basically means is Paul summing it all up. He's saying, hey, relational harmony sustains happiness. And harmony starts with humility. So there's no way to be unhappy in your relationships except for being through humility. And so today, to choose joy in relationships means to choose to be humble. To choose joy means that I consistently choose humility. That's the promise we're given. And so I'm going to give you four things. Four things that's required of you to choose humility in your life. Here's the first one. To, ch to choose humility, it's going to require that you're grateful. That you're grateful. Um, here's what we never see in Paul's writings. We never see him grumbling about people. Instead, we always see him being grateful for the people in his life. Again and again, we find Paul saying, hey, I, I'm thankful for them. Treat them well. They treated me so well. I, I love them. I, I'm so appreciative. Again and again, Paul is just grateful, grateful, grateful. And we just don't see him like, you know, be, treat them well. But, but John, you, you give John the stink eye because the way John treated me. We just don't see that in Scripture. Because Paul has determined to himself that he's going to be grateful for the relationships he has in his life. And you know what? Every study, every psychologist and sociologist since Paul has come to the same conclusion that grateful people are the most happy people on the planet. That again and again and again, people who have an attitude of gratitude, who are thankful for their circumstances, are some of the happiest people on the planet. So, so here's the deal. If I want good relationships, I have to develop a habit of being grateful for the people in my life. And you know that's true because if you've been married very long, let, let me describe something to you. Marriages start to crumble when you forget why you first married that person. Marriages start to crumble when you start to see what they should be doing for you instead of what they have done for you. And, and marriages start to crumble when you forget what really brought you together. And, 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 and when you do that, you're on a downward slide. And so gratefulness is the way to, to stop that slide and start to focus again on the joy that it has brought together for the, for the first time. Now, you, when you think about people, let's just have an honest moment. When you think about folks in, in your life, you know, whatever relationship, are your first thoughts gratitude about them? Probably not. You know, your first thoughts may be what they need to do for you or how they're always late or why they haven't done that yet and, and how they hurt you in this way. Your first thoughts are probably not gratitude. And here's the problem. The more familiar you come with someone, the more you take them for granted instead of giving them gratitude. And for a lot of us, we just don't realize that. And here's what Paul shows us. Paul is writing about a friend in chapter 2 who brought him, came from the Philippian church and brought him some, some, some gifts, and he's sending him back. And Paul knows this guy well. Paul knows him really well. And I want you to see what Paul says about him because here's the truth. For us, the people we know the best are often the people that we're the worst to. 
but not Paul. Look at what he says. He says, therefore, welcome him in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in honor. Paul's been in a relationship with this guy a long time, and Paul says, hey, you need to honor him. You know what's powerful about honor? Honor means you value something. And and here's what Paul's basically showing us is that honor is not what we think in culture. Honor is not what you hold a position, therefore I must honor you. Honor is not that, you know, once somebody achieves something, they are deserving. Here's what honor is. Honor is choosing to see people the way God sees people. Honor is choosing to see someone. Paul says, hey, I know his life. Yeah, he picks his nose and he smells funny, but honor him because I can see what God sees. And and that's what you have to realize is that to be grateful, you've got to start seeing people like God sees people. Can I give you an example? Can I just something real practical? Stop measuring how far people around you have to go and start celebrating how far they've come. Stop, stop, stop just focusing on how far they've got to go because some of you, your folks have made progress. People in your life, your marriage has gotten better and all you keep pointing out is how much further it's got to go. Start celebrating what God has done and, and that'll get, create more expectation for what he's going to do. If you don't learn to do that, you're going to be miserable. You're going to be miserable when it concerns joy if you don't learn to celebrate how far people have come because if you only value or honor someone when they have taken and, 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 and reached perfection, you're never going to have any relationships because nobody ever reaches perfection, including you, by the way. And you're also not going to have much grace in the situation. You know why? Because that's not the way God works. The Bible tells us that when we were yet still sinners, that he demonstrated his love for us. If you're waiting for everybody to get their act together, you're not displaying God because he didn't wait that for you. He didn't say, well, let them get perfect and then I'll honor them and value them and bless them and love them. No, he said, hey, I can see what they are, but I can see what they can be and I'm going to choose to celebrate that and that's what I'm going to do in their life. So, so you got to learn to be grateful. Here, here's the second thing you're going to have to learn. You have to, to choose humility requires that I'm prayerful, that I'm prayerful. Now, help me. I, I want you to think of somebody that really irritates you. Think, think of, I, said, I said, think, not look. Think, not look. <laughs> think of who, who really irritates you, not look, okay? We're trying to repair things, folks. Um, now, I'm going to ask you two questions about this person. Here's my first question. Do you pray more for them or complain more about them? That person. Do, do you, it could be somebody who you just, you, you, like commuting buddies, and it's the guy that always cuts you off in traffic. Do, do you pray more for him or do you complain more about him? Now, here's the second question. Here's the second one. Does complaining work? So why do you do more of what doesn't work than what does? It it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, you know, let's take the emotion out of it. Let's just really approach it logically. Why do you do what doesn't work? See, here's the thing that we realize about Paul is is that he was constantly praying for people. But that's not because he was spiritual. And I I want you to, to, to not miss this. You don't pray for people because you're spiritual. You pray for people because it keeps you from complaining about people. You, you have a space to fill with what you will do about, with people. And you're either going to fill it with prayer or you're going to fill it with complaining. Look, look at what Paul says in, in Philippians 1.4. I love this. He says, in all my prayers for you, for all of you, I always pray. He's not saying I always pray because I'm so spiritual. He's saying I always pray because if I'm not praying, I'm going to start complaining about you all. So he says, hey, I'm just choosing to fill with that space that I'm going to pray. And then and, and, and that's really, really impactful because here's the truth. We want people to always change, but we don't want to always pray. You know, it's like for a lot of us, if, if people heard what we're praying over them, you're like, I pray over them. I pray every day that they get the stomach virus is what I'm praying over their life. I mean, if, if some of these people heard what we pray over them, no, no, we're talking about praying in, 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 with God's heart. You know what that looks like? Of saying, God, I'm not going to focus on change. I'm going to bless them. And I'm, I'm, God, I just, I want your best for their life. But God, I also want you to see, want you to show me what I need to see about myself. That's the exciting thing about prayer is it changes us and them. That it, it transforms who we are and them. Because here's the truth. You're not going to change anybody. You're not. But God can, and they can themselves. But here's the equal truth. You're not going to change. Nobody else is going to change you. God can, and you can. And so when you put your energy into prayer, what you're going to find is is that there's a release of the frustration, and God starts to work in their life and your life. That's the most incredible thing. And if you're really in a place right now that you'd say, man, my relationships are broken, I'm talking like there's no hope that it's going to work out. Prayer's your only choice. Prayer injects hope 
into the worst relationships. When there's no faith for a relationship, prayer puts faith there. So if you're here today and and you would say, we may not be together next week when I come back, you need to pray this week. Because it's going to put God's presence in you, and it's going to put God's presence on them, and and, and that's the only hope you've got. Now, here's the third point. He says, I'm grateful, I'm prayerful, and I look for ways to serve. Can can I just be honest with you up front? I I just want to be forthright. The first two are going to be a lot easier than the last two. The first two are going to be a lot easier than the last two I'm going to give you. But when you choose humility, it requires that I look for ways to serve. And and I want you to see what what Paul starts to say. Look look at this in Philippians verse 5. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Now, now thanks, Paul. There's a low bar. You know, but, 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 but I want you to notice something. Remember this word mindset. He says, I want you to have the same mindset as the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's what he goes on to say. Who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. You know what he's saying? Is that God decided to come to earth and he gave up all rights of being God to enter in to our, 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 into earth to serve us. And then look what he goes on. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. This is the, what Paul is basically saying is the most humble example that you will ever see is the Lord Jesus Christ because he was God who humbled himself and became man. That's how, that's how, I mean, it's creator steps into creation, eternal steps into time, seated on the throne, chose to be born in a barn, praised by angels, chose to be disrespected and suffered, lifted up by all of creation, chose to be lifted up on a cross. Paul says you're not going to find anywhere else a more humble example. And and, and every time that we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the most pronounced things we should look and see is his humility. That never once did he take and use his, his divine nature to make us do what he wanted us to do. Did he deserve praise? Yes. Did he require it? No. And he's saying that this is incredible, and you have to see this when you look at yourself, is that there is a great example that can show you how to do this. Now, here's what, um, I, why I love this passage, is because it helps me realize that, that, and really debunk this idea that man wrote the Bible. Because no person, you or I, would ever have written in a humble God. We would have written them in our mind what we think they should be. All powerful, always work, no, demanding, even vengeful towards those. Instead, we get a God that is the epitome of humility. That's how I know that this is divine is because I, none of us would have done that. And, and so the, the other thing that's tough about this, though, is when you look at serving and look at Jesus' example, is it is the exact opposite of our culture. The exact opposite. See, in our culture, the whole goal is to amass servants, right? I want to become powerful, rich enough, famed enough that I get people that serve me. And and Jesus is basically saying, no, 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 in God's economy, it's not the more people that serve you that tie to your importance. It's the more people you serve. He says that you want to know who's most important is the people that serve the most. Which is really this idea of kind of like the Mother Teresa principle. Mother Teresa gave up her life to serve the people who who were just the least. I mean, beggars and orphans in Calcutta. Nobody esteemed them. She gave up her life for that. And because of that, she became one of the most important people on the world stage. That literally her serving of other people gave her most important that kingdoms and governments needed to hear from her. That's the way the kingdom works. That's the way the gospel works. That's what Jesus did. Now, can I be honest with you? There is no magic wand of humility. Like you can't come up here and I just, you know, like bippity boppity boo and 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 you you just humble. It just doesn't work like that. Here's how humility comes about in our lives is that you have to have the mindset of Christ. Do you know what that means? It's a habit you develop. Isn't it interesting? Paul didn't say, hey, get the prayer of Jesus Christ, which will make you humble. He didn't say, make sure to try and buy that special stuff on the, you know, on the late night preacher sell you. That'll make you humble. No, he said, hey, it's a mindset. It's a habit. And, and, and what you have to understand about habits are they're developed in very little ways, not big, bold ways. You, you know, God is testing you every day to develop humility in your life. 
every single day. Every day in the smallest ways that often you may not even see it. He's trying to test you to say, are you going to become more of a servant or are you going to act in pride? And, and that, you know, like today when you leave this campus and you're walking across the parking lot, when you look down and see a piece of paper, in your mind you're going to think, yeah, I should pick that up. And then quickly you're going to think, well, that's somebody else's job and I'm here to be served. And, you know, that's not my job. That's, they pay people for that. We've got a staff that should be out here. Where's the staff that's supposed to clean stuff up? And what that is, that's a test. That's a test to see that God, the Holy Spirit, is trying to see again, how humble are you? How much can you, are you willing to serve? And, and it's one of these things that really breeds, in, it breeds into our relationships because the most successful relationships are built on the smallest acts of service. The most successful relationships are built on the smallest acts of service. There are not people who are more compatible than, to one to another. There are people who are more humble to one another. And what you're going to find is, is that without this, this understanding, you will continue to fall into pride, and you will not serve people even in small ways. And, you know, husband, can you get up and help your wife clean up dinner instead of clinging to the recliner after work? Husband, wife, can you compliment instead of complain? Notice how I cut you guys off. Can you compliment instead of complain? Employee, can you do more than you're paid to do? Employer, can you offer help instead of demands? Every day you are given an opportunity to develop this attitude and habit of being humble and servant in your life. And the more you do, the more joy you're going to find in your life. Now, I want to show you the last one. It gets even tougher. We're going to look, look, you start with you're grateful, you got to be prayerful, you got to look to serve, but look at this last one. Choosing humility requires that I do what's right, even when it's painful. Look at what Paul says in verse 8. And being found in appearance as man, talking about Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. What he's basically saying is, is that the right, in our relationship with God, the right thing to do, the right thing for us, was the most excruciating thing for Jesus. That what he's basically saying is there will come a point in your relationships where to do what's right for the relationship, it will require you to take on some pain. To do, <laughs> there is a point, spiritually speaking, in your relationship where in order to make it work, to do what's right for the relationship, you need to grin and bear it. You need to grin and bear it. You need to apologize even though you don't feel like it. You, you need to serve even though you're tired. You, you need to pray for someone even though you don't even want to utter their name. There will come a point in every relationship, he says, where you're going to have to do the right thing for the relationship and it's going to be painful. Now, you've you got to do it. You've got to grin and you've got to bear it. Not that you're faking it, but that you're choosing joy and choosing to display Christ. There was a lady um, just a few weeks before we started this series who I saw her walking across the lobby to me one Sunday. And um, I know the backstory of this lady. Over the last three years, this lady has dealt with her and her husband have, have been on a journey. Very difficult marriage issues. He has a strong addiction in his life. And this addiction has been present, and, and they fought it, and it's, it fights back. It's, it's put her on a roller coaster in their marriage. And, and it, to the fact that he's lost his job because of this addiction, there have been times that it's required. I mean, he's lived a double life. There have been lies and no trust. And, and, and to the fact that he's had to go away for treatment at times, leaving her alone in life. And, and when you look at it, you just you see, man, this is just, this is not a great situation. I know how tough, the, I mean, I can only imagine. And, and even to the fact that when he comes back sometimes, everything looks good, and then there's a relapse. It's just, it's just what many of you have to walk, you know. It's just, it's, that's, just that's what addiction, it's the battle, it's, it's fighting. And I can see her walking across the, the, the lobby. And, and, and so immediately, I just, I, I, I kind of prepared to start consoling her. And I want to be honest with you, when you look at a situation like that, there are a lot of people who would say conventional wisdom says leave him. 
Conventional wisdom says get out of that. And that, There's a lot of people who would really understand if you, as many times as you've lied and done these things, I, I'm out of this relationship. And, and you would almost be celebrated in certain circles. I know Christians who have encouraged other people to leave those kind of, I mean, it's just, it's, it's tough. And she, she's coming across the lobby. I was preparing to console her, but I noticed very quickly that she didn't look like she needed consoling. And I thought to myself, this, this is interesting. And so as I began to talk to her, it's not that she didn't realize there was still a problem. It's just that she had such a positive outlook, even to be three years into this battle. It was so stark to what I expected that I just, I said to her, I said, you really have joy, don't you? And she, she just looked at me and smiled and she, and, and she said, yeah, I do. And then she said something to me that was so overwhelming. Because here's what you have is this lady is chosen when everybody else says you should get out of this. She's chosen to do the right thing in spite of pain. She's chosen to be a, a, a wife, a spouse who will not just abandon, but who says, hey, I'm going to get in here with you in this fight, and, I'm gonna, and we're going to see this to freedom. Like when everybody else says, hey, bail, she says, I'm going to do the right thing even though it's painful. And she said to me in this moment, she said, the Lord really has given me joy. Joy is something he offers me every day. I just have to choose it every day. And she says, and when I do, she says, some days I do and some days I don't, but when I do, it gets me through that day. Here's what we discover. When you do the right thing in spite of it being painful, when, when any decision that ends with you humbling yourself, you'll find supernatural joy. In any decision that you choose to do the painful but the right thing, you're going to find a well of supernatural joy on the other end of it. Something that you couldn't get yourself, something that circumstances don't, don't proclaim you should have, but you're just going to give it because God gives grace to the humble. Unseating pride is not easy. But it only takes one step, one moment, one act, to allow grace into the situation. So in some ways, you don't even have to be a humble person. You have to make a humble act that releases God's grace for you to become a humble person. You, you don't have to get it all right. You just got to get the next step right, the next conversation right. You just have to get the next interaction right, and grace will be relieved, released, and it will allow you to then become the person you want to be. When I was praying about this today, um, I really sensed the Holy Spirit asked me a question and gave it to me to ask you. Because here's the truth. For a lot of us, we can get in the details of why our relationships at work or in a marriage or with kids aren't working. But the truth is, it's either pride or humility is operating. And this was the question the Holy Spirit gave me to ask you. Do you want to be right or do you want to be reconciled? Do you want to be right? Do you want to have your position? Do you want to have the moral high ground? Or do you want to be reconciled? Do you want to be the person who it's my way and it's my and I it should be and I'm right and it's all? Or, or do you want to be reconciled? For some of us, I think we want to win more than we want another relationship. You could be a winner, but you're gonna be all alone. Would you just give that up today and you'd say, you know what, my point of view, all that, all that it is, the, 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 the what you've done wrong, would you just say, God, I'm just going to give that up today because the truth is that's pride and I'm going to do what Jesus did and I'm going to do the right thing even though it's painful. I'm going to do the right thing in this relationship. Some of you, let me get real practical, some of you need to immediately apologize to your spouse. Some of you have a strange, and I felt this in prayer a lot. You have a strained relationship with your, your kids, and you may be right, but do you want to be reconciled? Do the right thing, humble yourself before them, and start that relationship again. For some of you, you this is tough. You need to go to the office Monday, and you need to sit down with your boss, and you need to say, I've been stealing time. I haven't liked the way you've done things, and so I don't work as hard as I should. But from this moment on, Oh, I apologize for that, and from this moment on, you've got the best employee, and this whole place is going to be me. Some of you need to do that. Some of you are employing people, and you need to go to them and say, I'm sorry, I, 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 always bring, I put more pressure on you than bring good things out of you, and I'm sorry for doing that. And when you do, grace will be released. 
When you do, all of a sudden you'll sense God's presence coming into the situation. And you'll find joy because there is no joy apart from his presence. So here's what we're going to do today. It's going to be something very different. But I am so convinced that some of you, including myself, I told you up front, this has one of been one of the toughest messages I've ever put together because every time I read it, I keep, it's like, God, we need to be talking about those folks, not me. i, I got to talk to them. It's just been wearing me out. Here's what I want today. I don't want you to miss an opportunity to have a moment with God. And so I'm going to pray over us. We're going to stand together and I'm going to pray. But when I say amen, if you're here today and you would sense the Holy Spirit touching your heart and you know that you have, uh, you've been operating in pride, you know that your marriage, you've been prideful, you know that, that, that it worked, you know with your kids, whatever it is, you know, I don't want you to miss today as an opportunity. I want you to come forward and, I want, and nobody's going to pray for you. You're going you're to have a moment with God where you can just say, God, I'm sorry that I've been opposing you, that I've been, it's all been about me in the relationship and at work. God, I'm sorry that I made it about me. Will you give me the grace to humble myself and do what's right, to apologize, to, to have that conversation, to send that text? Will you give me the grace? It doesn't have to be a long moment, but I want you to have a moment with God. If you're here today and you say, well, why can't I just have it in my seat? I think that, that, that part of walking up here is humbling yourself before God. And saying, God, I'm willing to do what's uncomfortable to me because I need you to work in this relationship. I need you to, God, I'm, I'm so in need of you, I'm willing to change locations. So, and here's what you're gonna get. As soon as I say amen, I'll beat all of you there. I'll be the first one. Because I need grace in my relationships as much as you do, and I operate in pride more than you do. But I want today to leave knowing that God's grace is being poured out because I've humbled myself before him. So will you stand to your feet? And I, I want to pray over you today. I want you to go ahead and close your eyes and just start focusing in. And here's what I believe is happening right now. I believe right now, as we pray, the Holy Spirit is going to start showing you instances. Conversations that you, you know, he wished you didn't have. Comments. Posts. Emails. Actions towards your spouse. Actions at work. And, and, and what he's doing, he's not trying to make you feel bad. He's trying to show you the action so that you can turn from that action next time. He's showing you what he's going to give you grace for this next time. So as every just person is, is, they're focused on themselves, their eyes closed, their head bowed, they're just, Holy Spirit, right now, I'm just asking you to show every person where pride exists in their life. And Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to, to, to just show that to them so that they, it can be corrected, it can be, a, a grace can be given for it, strength so that they can walk in humility. And God, there is no happiness apart from harmony. And there's no harmony without humility. So Lord Jesus, let that happen today. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, you'd touch every person here and me first. Every ounce of pride that is in us, I pray that it would be fleshed out today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that every selfish motive, every every selfish ambition, every vain idea that we want to be the center, it has to be our way, it's all about what we want. Father, will you just cleanse us of that today? Forgive us for living that way, and will you just pull that out? Will you display your grace over lives, that you'll give husbands the ability to apologize, to say the words, I'm sorry, and maybe they've never said them. Even after years and years and years of marriage, Father, give them the grace to do that. Father, give parents the ability to pull their kids in and say, you know what, let's put his water under the bridge, let's focus on a new day, I love you, will you forgive me? Father, I pray that right now you would be speaking to people that need to talk to their employer and and employers who need to talk to their folks. God, will you just do such a work in us today and just open up your grace, don't let us live in opposition to you, open up your grace over our lives, heal our marriages, heal our, our families, heal our friendships, and Lord Jesus, heal every bit of us when it comes to pride because I don't want to be opposed to God but I want his grace to be over my life and Lord we just ask this humbly today knowing that we can't do this in ourselves it's only through you in Jesus name and everybody said amen for those of you today who you feel like you need to have a moment with God I want to encourage you to come right now take this time and just say God I need you to do this in me nobody needs to pray for me I just need you to do this in me today Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this message was an encouragement to you to live a life fully devoted to God. For more information about Twin Rivers Worship Center, or if you would like to partner with this church's ministry in St. Louis, Missouri and around the world by giving, visit us at our website at trwc.com. 
We would love for you to join us in a worship service at one of our two locations sometime. Have a great day and be blessed.